Hi, my name is Dr. Erin Sanders McDonough. I'm a lecturer in criminology at the University of Kent. Um, today, I'm going to be taking you through a very controversial topic, which is should prostitution be illegal? Prostitution, often called the world's oldest profession, a very contentious subject. Uh, a lot of people have very strong emotions about this. It evokes a lot of reaction. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper and you'll almost inevitably see on any given day an article saying that prostitution should be illegal, that women involved in prostitution are victims and that they need to be rescued, and that in the UK we need to do something to address this horrible issue. Um, and there are certainly lots of people who see prostitution as problematic, including some people who've worked in the industry. Um, and there's lots of people who call for the abolition of prostitution. They suggest that prostitution should be made illegal in order to protect people. But what I'm going to do today is challenge some of these ideas and actually suggest that there are different ways that we can address this problem. There's different mechanisms that we can use to help address this issue and that prostitution, prostitution should definitely not be illegal. To give you some idea about why this is such a contentious subject, I want to introduce two competing paradigms. So there's two different camps who understand prostitution in different ways. And the first camp is what Ron Weitzer would call sort of the radical feminist orientation. So they recognize prostitution as problematic and they see prostitution as a violation of women's human rights in every single circumstance. Women cannot meaningfully consent to engage in prostitution because it's part of the patriarchy. Therefore, every single woman involved in prostitution is a victim and needs to be rescued. There's also a hyperbolization of uh, what happens to women who work in the industry. So there's not a sense that perhaps some women choose to work in it or some women might find their jobs enjoyable. This particular group understands prostitution to be horrible in all situations. So all women are victims, all women experience violence, all women need to be rescued. So there's a number of things that sort of frame this debate on the what we might call the radical feminist side, and they definitely call for the abolition of prostitution in all cases. On the other side, we have a group of people who recognize sex work as work. And by recognizing sex work as work, what happens is it shifts the debate. So the paradigm shifts, and we no longer see prostitutes as necessarily victims, and that's not to say that prostitutes can't be victims or can't be exploited, but that's not a necessary trait of prostitution itself. So in this paradigm, we see a shift towards recognizing sex work as work. And when we have this shift, what we notice is that the parameters change. Women are no longer necessarily victims. They might be victims, but they might also have agency to choose to, to work in that industry. They might have the agency to be able to make choices about what industry they get involved with. And they also recognize that prostitution is not monolithic. So we have street-based sex work, we have sex work in flats, we have different forms of sexual entertainment, and that it's important to recognize that each woman working in different sectors will have different experiences and individual women will have different experiences. So we can't hyperbolize, we can't have this monolithic understanding of prostitution. By recognizing sex work as work, we're able to look at the nuance and the difference between women's experiences. If we're going to think about how to address prostitution, if we're looking at these two competing paradigms, it's important to recognize that these two paradigms have an influence on how policy is determined and what policy approaches we might take to solve this issue or manage this issue. So I'm gonna introduce the three main uh, approaches which are prohibitionism, abolitionism, and legalization. Prohibitionism is what we see in Sweden and it's often called the Swedish model or the Nordic model. And this particular model seeks to eradicate prostitution. It's based on the premise that sex work is harmful for women. Uh, it's based on the premise that most of the people working in the sex industry are women and that most of the clients are men, heterosexual men. Um, and it places the onus on the purchasers of sex. So in this model, men are criminalized for buying sex and uh, sex workers are not penalized in any way. But actually, what we see happening in this model is if you cut off the demand side, so if you stop men from buying sex, it means that women who actively and agentically want to sell sex are no longer able to do so, and they're penalized as a result. The abolitionist model is the model that we have in the UK, and this model essentially seeks to criminalize activities related to prostitution, although not prostitution itself. 
So in the UK, it's perfectly legal to buy sex, but things associated with selling sex, such as soliciting, uh, such as pimping or brothel keeping, these things are illegal. And this particular model is based on the idea that prostitution, again, is harmful and that we should seek to reduce it as much as is physically possible. The final model we see in places like Nevada, um, in ranches outside of um, the main cities, and in the Netherlands. And the legalization model actually gives control to the state to regulate the sex industry. So in this model, selling sex is perfectly legal, buying sex is perfectly legal, but sex workers often have to register with the state. They often have to do that through official means. So they have to go to a uh, local government or the local police and give their name, give details. Sometimes they have to register with health authorities. And while this model certainly has some benefits in that women can sell sex and that they're able to do so without necessarily facing criminal sanctions, it also means that the state regulates what they can and can't do. And those who can't register with the state for whatever reason, they might be migrants, they might not want to register with the state, they might not want to be known as a sex worker in an official capacity, it means that they exist in a gray area, which becomes really problematic. So the model that I wanna talk about today is decriminalization. This is a really important move away from the three previous models, and it's something that we've seen increasingly as a result of sex workers' rights organizations and the movements, uh, the social movements that sex workers have kind of put forward over the last 20 or 30 years. So, under a decriminalization model, we have the removal of all laws related to the buying or selling of sex. So it's not legal, it's not illegal, it exists in this gray area where there's no laws at all. So it removes the laws, but it doesn't ne necessitate that women have to register with an authority. However, it does give them the opportunity to take advantage of things like labor laws, employment rights, and healthcare in an official capacity. So we've seen two instances where this has actually worked quite well. So one of the first places to introduce decriminalization was New South Wales in Australia. Um, and the only thing that really regulates uh, prostitution in New South Wales in this particular area, it's mostly planning laws. So where brothels can be located, what times they might be able to be opened, what neighborhood they might be in. Um, and after New South Wales introduced this legislation, New Zealand followed pretty quickly after. And in New Zealand, actually, you had prostitutes and you had sex workers really pushing for reform. And in 2003, the Prostitution Reform Act was passed as a result of sex workers' rights organization and as, as a result of their agenda pushing. So they really wanted decriminalization and they gave evidence over a number of years to suggest that decriminalization was the best model for keeping sex workers safe. So if we think about what's happened since 2003, there was actually a study done in 2007 looking at what happened when decriminalization was implemented. So an independent study assessed whether or not decriminalization in New Zealand over the first four years of its existence had had any tangible impacts, maybe, ne maybe negative impacts, perhaps positive impacts. They're really trying to find evidence just to demonstrate whether or not prostitution, the decriminalization of prostitution worked. And what we could see here is that in this particular study, there was no increase in prostitution. So one of the worries is that if we decriminalize prostitution or if we legalize it, then we'll have loads of people wanting to engage in the sex industry or sell sex. But there was no increase um, in this study in the first four years in New Zealand. There was an increase in safety for sex workers. Sex workers reported feeling much safer. There were fewer incidents reported to the police. And in fact, one of the most important things that came out of decriminalization was that sex workers were able to engage with the police. So if they experienced violence from a client, if they had a sexual assault, if they were feeling worried about anything, they could contact the police and the police would take those concerns seriously. Under uh, abolitionist or prohibitionist models, that's not really possible. The police aren't there to support sex workers. But in this decriminalization model, you could start to see relationships between police and sex workers improving. Uh, you also saw increased employment rights for women. So in one interesting case recently, a sex worker working in a brothel was able to sue her manager for sexual harassment. That wouldn't be possible under almost any other model, the legalization model perhaps, but decriminalization also works to help reduce stigma. So this is one of the most important findings because stigma is one of the reasons why sex workers don't report crimes. It's one of the reasons why they might not tell their family what they're doing. 
why they might not want to be open about the fact that they sell sex. So by decreasing stigmatization, by decriminalizing, you were able to open up all of these other areas to make sex workers safe. In terms of other evidence, we can see that there are a huge number of international organizations that recommend decriminalization. Uh, Amnesty International last year quite famously came out in support of decriminalization. Uh, the World Health Organization, uh, the United Nations, these are just some of the international bodies that suggest decriminalization is an evidence-based model and they use this evidence to suggest that decriminalization will help keep women safe. And that's not to suggest that there aren't problems with prostitution, that women don't experience exploitation, that trafficking doesn't happen in some situations, but the, all of these organizations recognize decriminalization is the best possible way actually to prevent people from getting into prostitution if they don't want to, to reduce coercion, to reduce elements of exploitation. So the evidence base for this is really strong and you can see this across a huge range of organizations, not just internationally, but in the UK as well. So there are a number of groups in the UK who advocate for prostitutes' rights. The English Collective of Prostitutes has been going since the 1970s. Uh, SWARM, which is a sex worker advocacy and resistant movement. The Sex Worker Open University. All of these groups are advocates for sex workers across the different sectors and across different parts of the country. And these organizations in the UK also suggest that decriminalization is the best possible strategy for keeping sex workers in the UK safe. We can look at other examples of sex worker rights movements. Some really nice ones, if you're interested, uh, is Empower in Thailand. They've been working with sex workers uh, for decades, trying to increase sex workers' rights. Uh, Scarlet Alliance in Australia are really pushing for the decriminalization model to be moved beyond New South Wales into other parts of Australia where there are elements of abolitionism and prohibitionism. And the African Sex Workers Alliance is a pan-African movement that advocates for decriminalization for a number of different African countries and African sex workers. So in conclusion, I, I want to really reiterate the importance of listening to sex worker voices. This is what sex workers say they want. They want decriminalization. There's an evidence base that suggests that this is the best model for keeping sex workers safe. And it's a contentious issue but it's an issue that really needs to be thought about carefully and we really need to look at evidence in order to make um, any kind of policy changes or policy initiatives to address this problem. Thank you very much.